Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Latest Shiny Podcast. With me, as usual, is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good day to you, Rob. Hello, Stephen. And uh, with us today is a uh, professional podcaster. I think we'll use that term. We've had some people lately that are newbies, but uh, uh, Eric Wright, uh, who is a technology evangelist, evangelist excuse me, at Turbonomic. Eric, I think you may have done more podcasts than Rob and myself combined. I I thank you for having me on. It's kind of I love being the the other side of the microphone. It's such a such a nice break. Uh, it and actually I shouldn't say that it's, it's it's been a break for me. I actually haven't podcasted for a while, and I've been I've been bad about that. And it's just, it's a good time to sort of rethink why I need to get back into it. So it's you guys are going to get me back on the horse, which I love. Well, that's great. So before we jump in, um, I always like to you know our guests to just kind of give a quick overview of. Um, what you do at Turbonomic, a little bit about yourself, and then uh, I believe today we're doing a podcast rant, so I'm very excited. These are some of my favorite kind. That we're, Rob and I are good at ranting. <laughs> yeah. uh, skill, finally a skill. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. so my, uh, Eric Wright, uh, I am otherwise known as Disco Posse. That's my easy moniker to find me under. I'm all over the place under that. I'm a, uh, I read at discoposse.com. That's my, my, my side self, uh, my main self from, from the regular daytime stuff is I'm the uh, director of technology uh, or technical marketing and technology evangelist for Turbonomic. And uh, we're, we're doing some neat things around full stack, you know, in and out of on-prem into the cloud all over the place. Uh, yeah, really doing some, some neat stuff. Uh, I'm primarily kind of the community face and, and just doing a lot more like analyst stuff facing recently, which is cool. So I've, I've had a lot of fun changing my role over the last little while and, and, uh, and watching the community and jumping into new communities too, which was, which is kind of cool. I mean, I, I kind of know you guys from, you know, sort of early meetings and how we got connected through stuff. And, and here we are many communities later and we're still together, which is awesome. It's, it's fun to find people who want to be parts of communities, talk about them, um, and sort of analyze them, right? Some of these, some of these things you, you need to, you, if you're, you're too, if you've drunk too much of the Kool-Aid, uh, it's, it can be a problem. So. Yeah. Uh, we're, and I love that we're not like the idea that you're not contrarian, but you <laughs> have, you question things throughout, like there's, it's the right way to go. Like I, sometimes I perf, I purposefully like just toss it like, should we really be doing what we're doing <laughs> just to kind of measure people? And, and, and I, you are particularly good at this, Rob. Uh, uh, oh, thank you. It's, it's cool because I love some people kind of, they look to like, Oh man, he's really like, is he against what we're doing? I'm like, no, he's reminding us why we're doing it. <laughs> That's a nice distinction. Thank you. That's uh, so, how so people are sometimes with OpenStack. People are like, Rob hates OpenStack. I'm like, no, no I, I love the community. <laughs> uh, it just, it's just somebody, yeah, somebody needs to wave a flag sometime and say, that is not the road. That is not the road. What was that song they said? Like, it's not the band I hate, it's their fans. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it, it, I, it's that, that thing. We got to be careful about group think, you know, those, that's, yeah. That's sort of the thing that uh, I find is that we, we need to question sometimes. So speaking of groupthink, so I, uh, people who listen to this podcast know we talk about edge infrastructure all the time, and I promise we will, because I think Eric's got some really fun things to say for edge and turbonomic and things like that. But before, uh, Latest Shiny was originally founded as a rant cast, um, meaning that we would, we would say something that, that's troubling us, bothering us, you know, sort of get it off our, our chest and say, Rah! and then, um, you know, and, and explain why maybe we're mad, but we're really not mad. Um, <laughs> and so I was going to indulge in some rant casting with you, if that's all right, um, about some of these trigger words that, that people have. Um, I turned up one for myself, with, which was uh, private cloud. I didn't realize it'd become a trigger word. You mentioned serverless. Um, do you want to dive in on on a on one of these trigger words that oh, seem yeah. to get people very distracted? I tell you, I got one that came up yesterday. I was in a full day analyst meeting with a lot of really great folks, and hybrid came up, and mm. it was just like, stop using the phrase because it, it's meaningless. It's because it's what it was. 
it, it has it had no distinct definition in what we were trying to talk about. It's funny, like we it becomes the wrapper phrase for things, but it itself doesn't have meaning. So that was kind of neat that somebody was like, just stop saying that, stop using that word. <laughs> so how did, so, so, I mean, what happened? So you're in a meeting, somebody's like, ah, oh, it's a hybrid, whatever, whatever, whatever. And did somebody like, no, that's, it's not, that's, that you get the fight or. Yeah, it was really this thing of like hybrid cloud. When we talk about hybrid cloud, they're like, oh, just, we, we, there's no need to say hybrid cloud. Like everything's hybrid. Like we get it. Like there is no pure cloud. There is no multi-cloud. It's like, it's just a bunch of clouds. Like we, the way that we, and I guess because if I look at the way we define hybrids, say like two, probably two to three years ago now, the original you know, goal of hybrid by like the NIST definition of it was that it was, you know, clouds on either side where we had portable workloads that actually went between them. And you're like, yeah, no one, no one does that. <laughs> like, it's, it's like it's, you had somebody try to pull out the NIST definition of cloud yeah. and hybrid cloud. <laughs> and it was like, and same thing for private. It, and I love that we had this thing. They're like, it is such a, such a, terrible definition of it that no one can possibly achieve and 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 in, in practice and i guess that's the real reason is why we hate the phrase hybrid cloud is because hybrid just means that it's not one cloud like or it's not only on-prem or whatever and like everything's hybrid of course it's hybrid it, have, have you had people trying to distinguish between hybrid and multi-cloud and getting animated about that oh it's it, it happens a hundred percent more than it should. <laughs> <laughs> you mean if it happens once, it's been a mistake? <laughs> huh. Yeah, it's and so I say this because we look at like what what my organization is doing. You know, like we're trying to figure out how to define a lot of the things that we do, and it's like there's a difference. Like there's what do you do, and what's the messaging right, that you wrap around it, and how do you yeah. go to market with it? And it's like so we 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 have these sort of existential annual crises of like all right, new year bunch of campaigns coming out like how do we phrase stuff and like words are so are, are strange little things and, and this is what we're wrapped up in is like how do we message this and we said like you know do we shed hybrid cloud in our messaging because it doesn't really exist you know or that it already existed and i don't know it's, that was the big thing so this is where i would dis i would defend hybrid cloud um in that there is a utility for saying hybrid cloud. Um, and I, I do one of these about serverless too. And so it, where, I, where I embrace serverless after rejecting it. Um, and I agree with you. There's, there's a ton of people like us who, you know, grind our teeth, sometimes don't even manage to hold back our epithets um, about <laughs> hybrid cloud <laughs> and private cloud and multi-cloud. But then, then there's a utility side to what you're trying to say. Um, and does that, you know, do you, do you manage to get past what, what, you know, what there is and why they're saying it into something else? Yeah, it, I mean, that's the thing is it goes, it makes sense when you're in a true conversation and like you're getting to why you say it that way. I think the, the reason why we get stuck on these things is when you've got to put it up on a web page and it's a tagline, like what's the most meaningful mm -hmm. tagline? And we get this all the time. We're like, people are like, what do you do? I'm like, I do like everything. It's like on-premises, traditional virtualization. We've got public cloud, hybrid cloud, containers, whatever. I'm like, oh God, there's no single tagline that's going to make sense. And so you end up with this thing of creating this and that's why so hybrid worked. But then if you say hybrid cloud, do you then offend people that aren't using, like aren't, uh, aren't proudly using cloud resources? And oh, like, cause I know everybody's using the cloud, like legit, like whether they realize it or not. It's my favorite question to ask when I have, you know, you know, speaking sessions. I'd be like, who here, raise your hand if you've, if you're using the cloud. Okay, and then everybody who didn't raise their hand, please raise your hand now. You just don't know you're using the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in analyst calls sometimes and, and they're like, well, what percentage saturation do you think Amazon has? And I'm like, 100%. And they're like, well, no, no, what percentage of the market? I'm like, 100%. And they're like, but other, there's other clouds, aren't there? And they're like, yes, there are. But everybody uses Amazon and something else. Yeah, if they're, not using it, if they're not using it directly, they're using it indirectly. <laughs> exactly. And, and if they're, even if they think they're, you know, a 
all in on Google or Microsoft or something like that, I guarantee you there are development teams that are IT teams have Amazon accounts and they've got, you know, stuff in S3 buckets and, you know, <laughs> somebody's downloading stuff into their corporate environment from an S3 bucket. Exactly. Um, so I think hybrid IT is, is, is a legitimate phrase. Like I dig that. Uh, I'm like, but that's real. Cause it's like, we are wherever you're in DevOps ish, you know, uh, you're, you're talking to a guy who owns a domain called DevOps ish full stack in this, because that's the way that I describe what, how those things work. And like, we have a dog. even could, worse than light is shiny. So I, can I, you, I, can I you say you. that again? DevOps. <laughs> DevOps ish full stack in this. Very good. <laughs> It's, it's neither, uh, neither nor and all of the above. It's oh goodness. So, so I think that's like, that's why I love hybrid IT. Cause it makes sense. Like we're doing a lot of different yeah. things and we haven't really, we haven't embraced, you know, one or the other, but we do all of them versus hybrid cloud. It implies that you're using cloud. Cause even when we say like private cloud, it's the whole thing. Like, no, it's not private cloud. It's just virtualization with a couple of bash scripts running on top of it. Like this is not self-service. <laughs> true. You're not using a cloud. Like even if you, if you deploy V cloud director and you're a VMware shop, you, you're still not using, you're using V cloud director to carve out <laughs> templates. Totally not cloud. <laughs> and this, this to me is where, the, the people, you know, people using Amazon sort of woke up and I would actually say this was 18 months ago or two years ago and realized that the definition of cloud ha has become this, you know, service catalog of capabilities that are interlocked in, in, you know, a pretty compelling way. But the idea that v VMware you know, replicates the service catalog that Amazon's been building or these other cloud providers has been building is, is sort of laughable. Um, and to me, that's part of where the, the private cloud hater comes in. It's like, no, just virtualizing does not create a cloud for you. I just realized we came up with a phrase right now for this next generation of IT admins. We're going to call them woke IT. Like that's just the, we, we've done it. <laughs> they figured it out. They've, their eyes have been open. I am a we, 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 we better trademark it before Gartner rebrands their mode one, mo mode two is woke and unwoke. That's right. Um, but at least then I would know which mode was which. It would, it would be great. I can't, I can, I'm, I'm on cars, calls with, the Gart with Gartner people and I'm like, I can't remember which mode is the, is the, is the try new things mode. <laughs> that's right <laughs> uh and and for me the, the hybrid stuff if you're using the phrase hybrid cloud to describe a problem uh totally you get a pass or even if you're using private cloud to say oh my goodness we, we you know our it has all these on on-premises resources and we we've put it together like a private cloud if you're saying those things, I'm like, you're totally, you're totally in. If you're a vendor trying to say you have a private cloud solution and, you know, everybody should migrate towards, you know, platform X over platform Y, um, trigger, I'll give you my trigger warning right then. The, the thing, the, the thing that, that I tend to think the hybrid should have been called is heterogeneous infrastructure or heterogeneous IT, but people can't spell it. Uh, and abbreviating it to be hetero IT, it just, that is a complete failure for it's a term. Not cool. Not, cool. <laughs> not cool. Not cool. <laughs> so. Yeah. That, I've, I struggle. I've, I've had it in like my presentations before, for, especially like through the company ones as well. And it's, and it's like hetero, and I say like hetero, heterogeneous, I'm like heterogeneous, genus, genius. I'm like, oh God, I'm going to, and I trip over it on purpose sometimes just to, to prove how bad it is to use that word. <laughs> um, the other, oh, the other one that's because you, you said you snuck in a trigger one for me, P3, like, oh, and like, don't don't say that that's that's totally like the emc thing of like are you platform three like oh you have no idea what this even means <laughs> <laughs> i get the, i get that one on uh software defined infrastructure or uh software defined data center uh, which turned out to be a vmware sort of trademarky thing and then i'm like oh it's a decent term but yeah no i can't use it um yeah, we that's to... what's neat. They actually, so they, they've got a good, a good team of folks that chase down those things and they actually trademark them, which is, which is funny. And like that, I guess that's, that's kind of what you have to do, you know, when you're that size of an organization. Uh, uh, but 
yeah, it also feels sort of dirty now that you have to like worry about what you say because it could be a trademarked phrase out there somewhere. Yeah, no, and you know, you're, you're putting little red circles on it. That's no, I, and that, that to me is, is the exact thing we're scared about when we talk about these big vendors, you know, showing up in a space and trying to, you know, and, and throwing down their influence. In some ways, I think that's what we're VMware, um, or, you know, and, and they're, I have to say, you know, we talked to somebody from VMware, uh, Gina Minx, uh, a couple, you know, a couple of podcasts ago, great conversation. We really very humble about the vendor open source and community interactions thing. It was great. Um, and, and even so, I think they burned credibility in some of those behaviors where they had great community stuff um, and do still have great community, the VMUGs and all that stuff. I know you're involved in that community a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, and then the open source communities sort of run the opposite direction, um, where they, they shame vendors, um, who want, who, you know, for being vendors. Yeah, we've got, and we've talked about this, and there's a lot of societal things where we have problems with, because as soon as you try to help, like as soon as you try to dabble in something, it, it the moment that you, especially when it's a tough thing, like when you get into open sourcing things, you like, if you want to go and, and my company, we contribute to open source things. But the moment that you do, the first thing you're told is like, you're not doing enough. Like, look, I'm trying, like, I, I got to start with one commit. Like, let's work our way up here. It, yeah. And you want to proudly tell that you're contributing to an open community. And, and of course we see this all the time too. It's, it's more than just code, you know, it's, it's evangelism. It's getting adoption through sharing the message. There's lots of ways you can contribute without being a, you know, being a true coder. And, and it was neat. My favorite thing at, at KubeCon, I'll pick on this moment and, you know, said Kelsey's a Kelsey Hightower, phenomenal presenter, great community contributor, but it was funny at one point, he just like threw out a, a quick little quip. And it was the first time I knew that KubeCon had grown up because he says it was something about GitHub had thrown a big party. He says like, Hey, you got to spend that VC money somehow. And people were like, Ooh, like there was almost like a visible, like an audible boo in the room. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. Be careful making VC jokes because that's how these communities stay alive because we are, we got to get funded by something. And so it was, it was interesting to hear that thing of like, in a smaller, in a meetup, we would chuckle greatly, <laughs> but right. like you're at a, you're at a large scale, larger scale conference and like, Ooh, okay. Sorry. I totally took us down a rabbit hole on that one, but. Uh. <laughs> no, these are, I mean, this is what we like to do, right? We want to draw out the conversation a little bit and think through. And I, I know everybody, uh, I don't know every, I have a lot of experience with these big vendor funded parties. A lot of them are ultimately, you know, VC funded um, and not always, a good use of funds from that perspective. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's, I always used to say like when, when, when you come into work the next day after a good holiday party, or whatever, and, and people, when they say like, so, Hey, how are you feeling today? <laughs> like that's, that's what it feels like when you, when you just burned a whole bunch of money at a, at a corporate event, you know, as a, as a contributor, we, we as an organization at my company, we actually stopped doing a lot of like party things. Cause you're like, First of all, you don't necessarily see the true ROI, but secondly, like what is the message that you create yeah. in doing that? Like what's the what's the value you give back to a community of customers or or contributors of whatever? And and for us we weren't seeing we weren't seeing a positive message come out of a lot of it. And so we kind of backed off. It also saves you a ton of loot. <laughs> Eric, I can tell you as someone who is at uh, HP and HPE the last couple of years and, and the OpenStack party got out of control, as you know. And oh, it was yes. An HP party. I mean, I remember Paris and things and we were spending, you know, a quarter of a million dollars for the party. And um, it became, what are we doing? I mean, who at the beginning, right? You spend the money to impress the developers that you care and you get it. That's what big companies do. But at some point you have to pass you have to kind of stand down from that because people don't need to be constantly reinforced that you care they want to see you using the product and contributing more than how much money you spend on a party but uh, yeah and, and that's pretty neat i mean and here's the fun thing too right i mean you you know this especially having worked in you know well both you guys worked in large organizations right that 
you you want to act it's that think globally act locally right like you're working for a large scale multi-billion dollar organization but you truly want to be grassroots about how you do a lot of things and how you interact with the community you know how do you 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 say that it's like yeah you recognize like ah, i don't think we're doing the right thing here you know did you feel there were other things that you could have done or did did they learn from that experience to then come at it a different way the next time around. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all it's all interesting. And then there was one comment you said, Eric, before that I thought was interesting. I saw a tweet on this the other day where you talked about contributing to open source. I'd like to get, well, I guess, both of your feedback. I think using open source is as important as contributing. Is that controversial? It was on Twitter. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, this is, this is the famous great thing, question. right? When, when I see someone, when I ask a question, uh, somebody had a, I forget who, I think it was actually, I forget where it originated, but a lot of people latched onto it. They said, if you're, if someone says, hey, I would love to see this feature, and then the response to it was, look, I'm not your coding slave, you know? Oh, yeah. And they're like, well, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Like, I'm like, I'm not a coder. I, and the whole thing of if your answer to any of my questions is submit a PR, I really feel like you just don't understand how to interact with a human. <laughs> so so I, I actually tell a story, an, open, an early OpenStack story along these lines that, that I, I flipped my perspective on. Um, there was a, it was in the, at the Cactus Summit, so the third conference. Um, I well, we weren't even in school. <laughs> yeah, that was mine. Well, told, well, but but this, yeah, it was yours. <laughs> that was <laughs> a good one. We had. I still have all the the swag from that one. That was a great. Yep. That was a great conference. But we had this huge meeting, um, and you know a whole bunch of people were super excited. And somebody from, uh, you know, a new a, an emerging user, big automation studio, um, stood up and said, "Hey, I, I really think we need this type of feature, that type of feature." And somebody shouted back, you know, stand up and code it. This is an open source community. And uh, at the time, I was like, wow, that's really empowering, right? This, this you know, user's here, and we're, we're really encouraging them to get involved in the community and things like that. And, you know, years later, I, I look back at that same incident, and I'm like, this was an operator who was trying to use the software and was trying to find ways to make it productive. And instead of saying you know, we're here to help you. We want to work together. We were, we basically, you know, through, you know, through, through them, through cold water on them in a way. And uh, while it felt very, at the time, very community centric, it, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, that's, I don't know. I, I don't think open source communities should force everybody who wants to use the software to be a use a contributor from a code perspective. Right. Um, yeah, it's kind of this thing where I said, like, I, tr I said, I think I, I forget when I wrote it, it was years ago, and this idea that open source is like a book where nine out of the 10 chapters are completed and the 10th chapter is blank. And when you ask what happens next, and someone yells at you and says, it's your fault that we don't know. Okay, like, <laughs> Like I, I was like oh, hoping wow. to see where it was going. Like that's, that's where the way it feels like sometimes when you're like, like you said, like con contributions come in many ways, including documentation, adopting it. Like you said, Stephen, like using products yeah. is, is a, is a legitimate way to promote an open source community and sharing that story. It, it's, it shouldn't be that responsibility of you to, you have to, proselytize it you know i always think of like the pendulets thing about atheism he says he believes you're not a good atheist if you're not proselytizing atheism and he says and i get why no one likes to do it because it's not a not a common and popular thing he's like but he says you have to do the same thing that the religious people do and like so it feels like this thing of if you're not actively driving this thing through code then therefore you are not effectively contributing to this community. I don't think it's, I don't think it's wide range. I don't think everybody believes that, but there's enough of it that it kind of slows down and, and gives people a bit of a bad taste sometimes. I, I, I agree. I, and I think that it also causes projects to have a degree of um, scope creep that, that can be sort of a bad thing for the projects because you can have somebody who shows up with, with use cases and they're like, Oh, I, I feel like I can put it into the project. And, 
you, you really want to be doing is making the project able to, you know, have adjacencies. Right. This is one of my favorite soapboxes, but projects need to embrace adjacencies. They don't need to absorb adjacencies. Um, and this is what, this was my complaint about OpenStax Big Ten. <laughs> something, something, Big Ten, something, something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, so embracing an adjacency means that you're going to write APIs and you're going to figure out how to integrate and document and you're going to, you know, and that actually creates a lot of momentum in a project. But when you look at it as absorbing them, then you're, you, you make a decision and then you've sort of made your actual scope smaller because now you fit that one thing, right? When OpenStack absorbed Heat, um, which is their orchestration platform, they basically you know, pissed off Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, Salt, Terraform, you know, and, and a whole layer of things that, that were better at some things than the thing they were trying to write. Um, and then didn't help focus on the APIs and the extension points and all the things that projects really need to be resilient. Um, wow, that was that. Wow, we went deep. Um, <laughs> on I think that. we could move on from the open source rant. Yeah, let's. I think I think that was fun oh, I'm <laughs> I can and enlightening. I learned edge. something. I, but let's. I want to jump into Edge because we love to talk about Edge, um, and and we always start with. Uh, and, uh, and Turbonomic, I think, has a really interesting play for it. So I, I promised we'd get there. But first, can you define edge for us? Oh, <laughs> well, this is the interesting thing. It's, it's like IoT. Uh, and, like, and I'm not talking like the sort of the, the analyst, you know, bimodal descriptions of, of what these things are. But it's, you know, the edge is just, it's, it's you know, I, and I used to remember, remember fog, that old thing. Yeah, that was a, that was a thing. Like fog, fog, is, fog the Ruby libraries or, they, or the edge, edge is the new fog. Fog was this idea that fog it, was, computing? It, was, it was Cisco's Cisco actually was the one that put that, that phrase. In oh, the, the fog category. Oh, uh, trigger yeah. warning. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so I think it's a lot of that, like edge is this idea that moving compute into the middle of this, of this sort of weird space between things so it's you know stuff that's beyond the router you know but not in the cloud not on prem uh in on mobile devices uh it's going to be small scale computing that's you know iot style stuff uh yeah it's it's a very <laughs> it, it's a very loose definition as it's it's hard for me to say i i think the big thing is what's the use case you know, what the use case in my mind of what an edge computing use case is, is that I'm going to do compute closer to where a workload is, but not on the workload itself and mm. not directly under the workload. So near it and yet not on another thing. So I'm not doing the compute in the cloud. I'm not doing the compute in, in where the workload lives, but somewhere in the middle of it. I like that. Actually, the nearness, the nearness component, I think, is something a lot of people agree, would agree with. Um, some people would say latent, low latency or something, but I actually think nearness is just as functional. Um, yeah, and, and the device can't do it, um, and, the, and it clouds too far away. I, I like that. I think that's very, very practical. And so, you know, in this... Sorry. So in this case, right, I think Turbonomic, which we, we need to have you define a little bit, um, because of the algorith algorithmic approach to uh, compute, compute placement, um, workload placement, might be, you know, so, sort of an interesting place to think about edge. Can you describe what Turbonomic does a little bit for us? Sure. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's funny where we're, we're literally, when we talked about like picking the words that describe it, we've, we've kind of honed in that it's in effect, it's like workload automation and, and optimization of workloads through automation, you know, and, and being able to define which workloads should run where and how to size scale and place those workloads, you know, both on initial placement and continuously in real time. And we want to optimize for both performance and cost. And regardless of the underlying infrastructure, regardless of the application itself. So that's why this workload is the unit that we're latching on to and why we're, 
we're creating this automation. When we look oh, at wow. in, in the on-premises stuff, it's, you know, placing and, and moving virtual machines and sizing them up and down in order to meet the needs of the workload itself and the application demand. In the cloud, it's the same thing, except obviously you're not moving it as much as you're scaling it up and down or placing it into the right regions, finding the right family of template, you know, to match its performance profile based on percentage of CPU memory and, and disk IO. So it's this, you know, N dimensional problem where you've got multiple dimensions of fluctuating performance to deal with. So, so, so what, you could conceivably include latency in that. Absolutely. Um, and then cost, right? So a compute a edge compute infrastructure might have more cost because it's a more restricted environment than a cloud infrastructure. And so optimizing, you know, a multi-factor between latency and cost could be a, a component and experience, I guess. Yeah, and, and if we think of where you, the, the fun part for us is when we look at kind of roadmap stuff where we're doing and edge is clearly in this roadmap. And the, the, the curious thing for us is what's going to run there. It's most likely functions that are gonna be happening in that edge layer. It's, not, it's, less, it's less about persistent, permanent compute that's gonna be, con that's going on there. And however, you know, there's going to be, there are going to be compute functions or compute objects that live there. And, you know, what's the right place to run them? You know, understanding the latency of, you know, east, west, north, south, understanding all that stuff. So we take that into account when we look at like workload placement and understanding the relationships between other applications. The cool thing is it's because it's dynamic, you have to continuously discover and understand that before you can make these decisions. And so making, using our decision engine to do these placements and, and scaling decisions and actions, you, we have to know, you know, what it's talking to, where it's coming from, what the performance profile is. So edge is awesome because we think, how do you know when you're looking at stuff that's like sitting in a cell tower, like where, what it, what is its adjacency to the next workload that it's going to speak to and understanding placement when you get into cellular networks and stuff. The core engine is what's cool because it will map to whatever infrastructure. So as we're building it, we just mm. simply map it to this next thing, which is big. So, so this creates from, you know, and we're starting to think through how you design edge infrastructure, you know, the ability to have a programmable infrastructure where, you know, you can, dynamically map workloads into, you know, a small space, um, understand the cost and latency components of that space, and then, you know, be able to reprovision and dynamically move things. Sounds like exactly the type of edge challenges that you're, that we're looking to solve together. I, I, I suspect they're not all the way solved yet. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it's the same fundamental problems that we've been trying to solve in the physical compute layer, like from day one. It's just that we've, you know, the models changed, but the fundamental challenges are identical. And so it's neat mm -hmm. that we've just shrunk the, the footprint of it, but the, the abstractions are different. It, but in, the, in a sense, it's gonna be the same problems. It's getting, those core components of CPU memory and storage and, and understanding the latency of each of those things. So and like I said, programmable ways to deliver, retract, provision, deprovision, et cetera. So you're, you're saying something that, that I, I've come to believe very strongly about edge infrastructure, which is that it's going to look a lot like cloud infrastructure from a programmability application design Right. I don't think it's going to have the same depth of resource or capability or services, but it's, you, we're not talking about a new paradigm for applications. It's, it's going to look a lot like cloud from that perspective. Is yes. that fair? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. so, you know, we, I want to, we're going to bring, we're going to bring this full circle because what you, what you just described sounds awful like what somebody would call hybrid. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think I could connect I all the way, that. all the way around. Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hybrid, it's hybrid server look. You, I, this was not a setup, but, um, <laughs> but 
I, I mean, this, there, there, is a, there is an element of what we're, what we're describing is this heterogeneous infrastructure with different capabilities in which workloads have to move back and forth between, you know, uh, one infrastructure and another infrastructure. Is that fair? Ooh, ooh, this is, oh, I, I, this is what I love. When I talk with you, I feel like Kahneman used to feel when he would walk down the road with Amos Tversky and they would just talk for hours and just like iterate until they came to these amazing conclusions. Uh, so, what it is that we're doing is we're creating a new style of compute that's going to map similarly to what cloud has already done, but there's going to be a slightly different set of capabilities. And what happens is the workload itself needs to be able to select where it can go based on the available capabilities at that infrastructure. So if we look at what hybrid is for us, if we, we think on-prem traditional persistent long running workloads versus cloud, which was kind of geared towards like shorter running stuff, Kubernetes, we have the same thing, right? When you say you're gonna run a persistent workload in Kubernetes, people look at you like you're twisted up, like there's something wrong with you. I'm like, no, that's, that's how we're gonna use it. We just, need, we just need to get, we have live migration in OpenStack. We got there, it didn't hurt so much, it was okay. Uh, you know, so it's what's interesting about hybrid is that how we choose where to run these workloads and this is my shameless turbo plug, right? The way that what we're focusing on is the workload has a set of criteria that it needs to be able to meet and it will choose what infrastructure it can run on that meets that criteria. And it will be limited in what infrastructure, what hybrid infrastructure can run on because of lack of available resources, right? Whether it's, you know, layer three, layer two on the network side, whether it's gonna be physical compute capabilities on the processor side, availability of storage, latency to and from its next adjacent uh, target, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think this is part of where we're seeing serverless and container-based infrastructure, immutability, program all these things that we see coming into from cloud and expectations from cloud um, you know if we design the applications appropriately we should cr be able to to leverage those concepts down into these edge infrastructures um, oh you know what we haven't triggered ourselves on yet it's, really, uh -oh. it's it needs more blockchain that's what we're missing <laughs> how did i miss that <laughs> only if it has machine learning and ai underneath <laughs> although i did see that post the other day that said i've been looking at blockchain for like five years and i still don't know what it's for did you guys see that post uh, <laughs> it's a great post that no one even knows what to do with it but yeah so uh, but no i i i, I agree yeah it's what what I love is that hybrid means the broad acceptance that what we've been doing is not wholly wrong and will continue to exist. And that we will find new patterns that we integrate with these previous patterns. And that's what makes it hybrid. It's, it's not that we're gonna take infrastructure like an Etch-a-Sketch and just shake it in the air and forget that what was there before. Like, this is what I used to struggle. I called them the, the as a service holes, the as hole. Oh, it's oh, the, it's oh the, no, don't no, do that. No. It's not acceptable. It's the belief that, <laughs> that, like, flag that, that traditional point. infrastructure <laughs> shouldn't exist anymore because cloud computing is available. Like that's what the, the birth of hybrid was, right? It's, uh, I, and that I, that's, what, that's what hybrid is to me. It's just the, it's the acceptance that we can't get rid of what we have, but we need to do something uh, new at the same time. So, so I, that I think is a really important point to me for edge, for hybrid in general, is that you know, we can't show up and say, what you did was wrong. I don't care about it anymore. You know, all hail the, the new king. Um, we have to, right, uh, the, the, the component of hybrid that's really important is that we have to embrace that there are gonna be multiple paradigms, multiple ways to do it. You discussed, you know, persistent storage and persistence. We can't just say, oh, we, we no longer have stateful apps, they're dead. Um, that's right. And so this is one of the things that I think, you know, we don't do well in open source communities sometimes is we don't look towards the adoption curve for the existing use cases we get very tied into um 
you know, the, the new shiny, exciting stuff. And we, we miss sort of this, this legacy enterprise or the historic workloads that really changed the adoption curve. Um, that's hard. It's just, it's a hard problem to me. That's what hybrid said, right. Reflects. It's like, I'm doing good work here. Help me do that good work in your, you know, with the new work um, instead of making it an AB switch. Yeah. And I, and I, I, we, we need to find, and this is where it is, is loving the appropriate patterns. You know, I, I love the cloud native pattern. I love the server list of the functions as a service pattern. Hmm. And, and I know that like, I it's and here it is. This is my my trigger, written in Go. Like that's <laughs> not a value proposition to me. As a consumer of something, I don't care that it's written in Go. Like I love that you why you've done it. Tell me why you did it. That's great because it was faster. It was whatever. Like I can create a Pixie <laughs> server in Go with a handful of lines of code. You're right, but when I compile it, it's 17 megabytes. And it doesn't need to be. Eric, I'm going to lose my job from that comment. I've been working on Go. So clearly, uh, you know, thank you for that. Rob, it was nice knowing you. <laughs> so so let, we should be very, very clear. Rackn writes a Pixie server in Go. <laughs> that is our business value. Yes, it is. <laughs> hey, you get the use message. ours. Don't write your own. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's so it's I guess so here's what I love portability <laughs> if if you if everything needs to be portable then 100% there's a trade off to doing so right which is and go falls a lot of really slick problems around that and the trade off for it is like you get speed you get portability and maybe there's some different things that you trade off and, and like I said it's people sort of jumped onto that like you know, here's where like Go super sexy, really neat things that it does. But like, look, I can write the same thing in Python in like 11 lines of code, but it takes me 48 lines to do the same thing in Go. And again, maybe it's it, there. It's it's uh it's not true you know comparison. So we have to be careful uh, about that. So so this is this is a, like a bonus topic in this podcast, and and we do need to we do need to wrap it up in a minute. But, but, and, and, and I'll encourage you, there's some, we've done some interviews with the Racken team about sort of this exact topic. Um, but, but I will tell you that we took a huge Ruby installation delivered in like 12 containers and converted it into one Go executable, retained 80% of the functionality um, and made that whole thing small enough to run on a switch. Um, uh, there you go. And that's the win, right? That's wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and, and it's multi-platform. You can run the thing on a MacBook. You can run it on, you know, a server. It doesn't, it doesn't friggin' matter. And I, I have to tell you, and, and the semantics of the, we do a lot of RESTful API calls and use uh, HTTP as our, as our RPC mechanism uh, and a whole bunch of other acronyms that, um, and Go just does those things so elegantly. Um, and what I as, can't as, wait for is in five years when we're like, oh God, you're still ready and go. That's disgusting. Like what? And the, I agree. I agree with you. No, it's down the road, right? I and that is that is the that I there is no one language and Go is not a panacea for solving problems. Um, and and I agree with you. The idea that it's good because it's written in Go, that's that's BS. The fact that I can sit down and give you some very tangible benef business benefits that we are conveying because of the language choice that we weren't getting in other languages. Um, right. I, I, I feel, and I, I have, I have a similar thing about, right. You know, people love to wrap containers around everything and they put containers and stuff they don't need. And right. Yeah. All sorts it's, of stuff. It's there, uh, Randy Schaub did a great, uh, great article and he talked about why you don't need microservices like to stop like because there's like look there's great reasons for it but do not make every single thing you do a microservices deployment because you may be spending unnecessary efforts where it doesn't really need to happen and it was it was neat he very very 
it, and it, he gave good clear use cases where like it doesn't matter like just let that monolithic beast exists it's going to die out on its own anyways like don't be racing to refactor it in in microservices because it's probably fine as it is and, and, yeah. and same kind of thing like so I, i'm a bit harsh uh, i'm not anti-go i just i'm always <laughs> i'm always worried when someone when a vendor comes to me to pitch a product and the first thing they say is it's written in go i'm like ah, tell me what it actually does though <laughs> i i will tell you that's i agree with you um we have people who walk up to us and the fact that things are in go translates into um a value proposition for them yeah um but that's uh, yeah no it's not the reason to buy don't don't never language choice is never the never never the the defining attribute I, I i had the same problem with openstack and python and early rubyists um yep. and the java and the, the whole java community as a, as a whole. we're looking I, at you language language opinionated people <laughs> yeah i sorry i snuck in a i snuck in a a, a surprise rant in there in the middle I, I didn't <laughs> this is there. the trigger warning podcast we should yeah, give people yeah. trigger warning but too. i agree like i said like what what edge is edge is really slick uh how we're going to consume it is really interesting uh i think it's intellectual discussions that are happening right now but there is really being implemented uh and when it will become understood it's like iot you know blockchain whatever like it's 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 happening uh and and how we're going to see it played out is really really cool and i'm hoping to be a part of a lot of neat use cases that are that we can kind of share and how we're we're doing neat stuff with it all right guys well the time has come rob and eric and oh no. this is actually good fun i love the open source discussion rob and i once did a podcast that was never released where we complained about open source for 45 minutes but didn't think anything <laughs> Yeah. And but, Docker, we threw Docker it was completely Docker under the bus. Thing. It was just bizarre. The secret podcast. But uh, Eric, can you just uh, give us, um, you know, how people can get a hold of you, find you? I know you mentioned it before, but we like to wrap it up. So, you know, people want to know more uh, about yourself or your company. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, so yeah, I'm at Disco Posse on Twitter. Uh, you can, I love to connect with people on LinkedIn as well. Uh, that's that, that other network, right? Uh, you can just, just search for Disco Posse. Trust me, there's only one of them. Uh, I, I, you can find me at my corporate gig. I'm at turbonomic.com. Uh, and hopefully I'll see you at a, at a community event, whether it's a Kubernetes meetup or something. So yeah, just yeah, reach out. Uh, always love to interact with folks and, and yeah, looking forward to a big 2018 back in some neat community stuff. Great. Well, thanks again. And, and for our listeners, if you, uh, if you do follow up with, uh, Disco Posse here, let him know you heard it here first. So he knows the power of our podcast. That's it. That's it. <laughs> well, I'm thanks again. Fan. I'm a big fan. Yeah. I, I get to do that thing. It's that first time, long time. First time listener. Long, yeah. First time <laughs> podcaster, long time listener. Long time it. listener. Well, thanks again uh, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you.